In our last installment, I announced our next topic, executive control of agency action, power to set policy. We tend to assume today that the nation looks to the president to set domestic policy and expects the executive branch to carry out the president's orders, as if he were the commander-in-chief of the entire nation, and not only of its armed forces. But this attitude is in tension with the role of Congress as the people's legislative assembly. There is no evidence that anyone ever offered a crown to George Washington. Washington himself declared that he did not get rid of George III in order to become George I. But if the presidency is not the office of a monarch, it is not a merely ceremonial office either. The presidency has always been regarded as special. Its distinction makes it what President Theodore Roosevelt called a bully pulpit that is, a more dignified sort of soapbox from which to address the nation and its elected representatives. President Taft, here pictured on the right, would agree. Both presidents also believed that it was much more than that. How much more? That question is not a president's to answer. In the early case of Kendall versus United States, the Supreme Court was called upon to decide whether the president legally could direct an officer to withhold a payment on a claim. Payment by the Postmaster General was a purely ministerial act under the statute, and the court confidently wrote that the executive power is vested in the president, but it by no means follows that every officer is under the exclusive direction of the president. Congress may impose upon any executive officer any duty they may think proper, which is not repugnant to the rights secured by the Constitution. In such cases, the duty and responsibility grow out of and are subject to the control of law and not to the direction of the President. The Court added that to contend that the obligations imposed on the President to see the laws faithfully executed implies a power to forbid their execution is entirely inadmissible. In Kendall, the postmaster's paying the claimant was a ministerial act under the statute, but what if Congress by statute had given the postmaster general a degree of discretion? What then? Clearly, the principle underlying Kendall would not allow the president to direct the postmaster to take any action that was outside the range of discretion defined by the statute. But what about the president's power with respect to the postmaster's choice made within that range? As Justice Elena Kagan has pointed out, if Congress had delegated limited discretionary authority, then the president, like the postmaster, would have to act within those limits. The remaining question is whether the president's involvement in carrying out the delegation would violate the Constitution. The question remains, that is, whether the president possesses directive authority over an official's exercise of discretion. On a broad reading of Kendall, the president would, have, would not have such authority. If the statute gave, for example, the postmaster the discretion to pay anywhere between a dime and a dollar, then Kendall, broadly read, would not allow the president to direct the postmaster to pay 25 cents. To allow that would be as contrary to the statute as it would be to allow the president to order non-payment. But on a narrow reading of Kendall, it would not. Of course, on either reading, the president might wish to fire the postmaster for failing to heed the president's advice. But it becomes significant whether the officer, whether the officer serves at the president's pleasure. If so, then the president obviously may fire the official for refusing. Chief Justice Taft makes this explicit in Myers, even in the case of a quasi-adjudicative act. But if the official has tenure, the four-cause protection would extend to good-faith defiance of presidential directive authority. Again, Justice Kagan's term. Remarkably, more than a century was to pass before the Supreme Court gave further consideration 
to the general subject. The Korean War is the setting of Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, better known as the Steel Seizure Case. The Korean War was never declared, and never ended, but was called a police action in which the U.S. joined under U.N. auspices. For all practical purposes, it was a U.S. war. The President had repeatedly asked Congress to amend the labor statutes to authorize him, in case of lockouts or strikes, to seize and operate munitions plants and other industries that supply war materiel. But Congress had repeatedly denied the President this power. President Truman asked certain friends whether he had the power to do this anyway, with or without specific congressional approval. These friends, who happened to include some of the sitting justices on the Supreme Court, assured President Truman that the Constitution gave him that power. As strikes threatened to disrupt the supply chain for the Korean War, President Truman issued an executive order directing his Secretary of Commerce to seize and run Youngstown and other steelmaking facilities. Whereas, in order to assure the continued availability of steel products during the existing emer emergency, it is necessary that the United States take possession of and operate the plants of said companies. Now, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and laws of the United States, and as President of the United States, and Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the United States, it is hereby ordered as follows. The Secretary of Commerce is hereby authorized and directed to take possession of all or such of the property of companies named as he may deem necessary in the interests of national defense and to operate or to arrange for the operation thereof. Take possession. Youngstown's sheet sued and the case was litigated up to the Supreme Court. The court, by 7 to 2, voted that the president did not have the power he claimed. Enraged, the president dictated a letter to Justice Douglas. I appreciated very much your letter of July 3rd, and I am sorry that I didn't have a chance to talk with you before you left. In fact, I'm sorry that I didn't have an opportunity to discuss precedents with you before you came to the conclusion you did on that very decision, that crazy decision that has tied up the country. I am writing a monograph on just what makes justices of the Supreme Court tick. There was no decision by the majority, although there were seven opinions against what was best for the country. I don't know how a court made up of so-called liberals could do what that court did to me. I'm going to find out just why before I quit this office. Sincerely yours, Harry Truman. The letter was never sent, but it indicates the president's surprise and disgust at learning that the Constitution denied him the power to act contrary to Congress's intent. Justice Robert H. Jackson's concurring opinion stated a three-part analytical framework that summarizes what courts and commentators have taken to be the principle that guided the result. Presidential powers are not fixed, but fluctuate depending upon their disjunction or conjunction with those of Congress. When evaluating the president's power, it is necessary to note whether Congress has spoken explicitly or implicitly on the subject. The President's power is at full tide when Congress has given its express or tacit approval. This was not so in Youngstown Sheet, for Congress had not approved legislation which would have specifically authorized his taking such actions as the steel seizure. The President's power is at low ebb when Congress has expressly or implicitly disapproved its exercise. The failure of the authorizing legislation amounted, in Justice Jackson's view, to an expression of congressional disapproval. But what if the president asserts certain powers in the absence of any indication of congressional approval or disapproval? Of course, Congress might later take action, but it might not. How are courts to evaluate presidential activity in this 
twilight zone. Justice Jackson did not say. Over the intervening decades, successive presidents have taken a more and more active role in trying to set a general course for the federal bureaucracy. Justice Elena Kagan, as a law professor, wrote an influential article on presidential administration, which was generally welcoming to efforts of the office of the president to bring coordination, harmony, and rationality to the manifold, scattered federal agencies. Consider this. What if Congress had delegated specifically to the Secretary of Commerce the authority to seize property? Could President Truman then have issued the order that he did? A broad reading of Kendall would answer no. And that broad reading had become conventional wisdom after the steel seizure case. But in the steel seizure case, Congress had not given the Secretary of Commerce any such authority. The conventional view in administrative law holds that the president lacks the power to direct an agency official to take designated actions within the sphere of that official's delegated discretion. She added, this is essentially the question posed by a president's use of directive authority, by his assumption that when Congress designates an agency official as a decision maker, the president himself may step into that official's shoes. As recently as 1979, the conventional view was, well, conventional. Presidents historically had shunned direct intervention in rulemaking and were loath to appear to be influencing regulatory agencies, even within the executive branch, to write regulations one way rather than another. But with the election of Ronald Reagan as president in 1980, the ground began to shift. <laughs>